ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಧಿಮರನ್ನಸಾಜ್ಞಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಖಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮಿಧೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮ We're continuing with our reading of the Srimad Bhagavatam. We're on the seventh canto, first chapter, The Supreme Lord is Equal to Everyone, taking up at text number eight, where we left off yesterday. When the quality of goodness is prominent, the sages and demigods flourish with the help of that quality, with which they are infused and surcharged by the Supreme Lord. Similarly, when the mode of passion is prominent, the demons flourish. And when ignorance is prominent, the yakshas and rakshasas flourish. The Supreme Personality of God is present in everyone's heart, fostering the reactions of sattvagun, rajagun, and tamagun. Purport. The Supreme Personality of God is not partial to anyone. The conditioned soul is under the influence of the various modes of material nature. And behind material nature is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But one's victory and loss under the influence of Sattvagun, Rajagun, and Tamagun are reactions of these modes, not of the Supreme Lord's partiality. Srila Jiva Goswami in the Bhagavat Sandharva has clearly said, Sattvadayo nashanti she yatracha prakrita guna sa shrudha sarva shrudhe pya Umam Adya Prasidatu Ladini Sandani Sambit Twaika Sarva Samstitao Lara Tapa Kari Mishra Twaino Guna Bardite. According to this statement of the Bhagavat Sandarbha, the Supreme Lord, being always transcendental to the material qualities, is never affected by the influence of these qualities. The same characteristic is also present in the living being. But because he is conditioned by material nature, even the pleasure potency of the Lord is manifested in the conditioned soul as troublesome. In the material world, the pleasure enjoyed by the conditioned soul is followed by many painful conditions. For instance, we have seen in the two great wars which were conducted by the Rajaguna and Tamaguna, both parties were actually ruined. The German people declared war against the English to ruin them, but the result was that both parties were ruined. Although the allies were apparently victorious, at least on paper, actually neither of them were victorious. Therefore, it should be concluded that the Supreme Personality of God is not partial to anyone. Everyone works under the influence of various modes of material nature. And when the various modes are prominent, the demigods or demons appear victorious under the influence of these modes. Everyone enjoys the fruits of his qualitative activities. This is also confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 141 141-13. The manifestations of the modes of goodness can be experienced when all the gates of the body are illumined by knowledge. O chief of the Paratas, when there is an increase in the mode of passion, the symptoms of great attachment, uncontrollable desire, hankering, and intense endeavor develop. O Sonakura, when there is an increase in the mode of ignorance, Madness, illusion, inertia, and darkness are manifested. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is present in everyone's heart, simply gives the results of the increase in the various qualities, but he is impartial. He supervises victory and loss, but he does not take part in them. The various modes of material nature do not work all at once. The interactions of these modes are exactly like seasonal changes. Sometimes there is an increment of Rajaguna, sometimes of Tamaguna, and sometimes of Sattvaguna. Generally, the demigods are surcharged with Sattvaguna, and therefore when the demons and the demigods fight, the demigods are victorious because of the prominence of their Sattvaguna qualities. However, this is not the partiality of the Supreme Lord. Let's just stop and see if there's any reflections or questions on the first verse. 
Hare Krishna, dear devotees, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions or share your reflections. Guru Maharaj, um, this, uh, this is Manjula. Um, this, this statement is a little confusing because we, we notice that uh, the Lord comes to the aid of the, of the demigods whenever they are in trouble, right? They go to Shweta Dweep, they you ask Brahma, and they, they pray to the, God, to the Lord for help. And he says, I'm coming. I know the situation is not right, and I will come to help you. But then it states, it states here that these changes are natural like season. And we shouldn't get perturbed with them because sometimes goodness is ahead. Sometimes uh, the, the bad people are ahead and that's the way the, the modes change. They seem to contradict each other. So what's your question? Why do they contradict each other? The fact that- Why does what contradict each other? That Krishna will come to help when, the, the, when, when Tamaguna is, is in charge. Well, you might notice that when Krishna comes to help, oftentimes he tells, for instance, when he, he meets with the the uh, demigods when they request his help and he says oh now's not a time that i can really do much for you you have to make an armistice with the demons because he said the modes are not in your favor right now so and you look at the demons actually they don't really like krishna's help for instance when the battle of kukshetra was shaping up and there was a question of who wanted krishna and who wanted krishna's armies and Duryodhana chose Krishna's armies because he didn't have any faith in Krishna. He thought better to have mighty force of the armies. Surely that will win out over Krishna. And when the demons were churning the milk ocean, they were a little suspicious of Krishna and uh, Vishnu and, and the demigods. When they first started to churn the ocean, the demigods and demons were holding the, excuse me, the demigods were holding the, the head of Vasuki and the demons were on the tail. And they said, hey, wait a minute, why should we hold the tail? Because we're great heroes and great learned personalities. So then Vishnu just went right to the tail and everyone followed him. Because the demigods and the saintly people, they follow Krishna, whatever he does. And the demons, they come up with their own ideas. So Krishna says, yeyatamam as they surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. I'm equal to everyone, but if somebody surrenders unto me, worships me, then they're within me and I'm within them. So it's the lacking of the, demi of the demons that they don't turn to Krishna because they have an aversion to them. They think they're, they're smarter than God. So they don't take his help. But he's there equally for everyone. You'll see that when the demons, when a demon does surrender, for instance, Bibishana, he was with the side of the demons, but his heart was different. So he went to Ramachandra and he said, I, I surrender. A few people said, you know, don't let him. But Ram said, if anybody surrenders to me, I accept him. Does that help? Yes, Guru Maharaj, very much. So, okay. <laughs> so I have also one uh, realization from the Dandavat Pranam. Um, I like the point which Jiva um, Goswami mentions in the Bhagavad Sandarbha. Mm -hmm. How the Lord, the Supreme Lord is transcendental because whenever we declare in any war, in India also we know in, there are people on the religious ground they fight sometimes. They say God is my side. Because it is, we declare ourselves God is ourselves, but God is really equal to both the parties. So it is just a matter they are interacting or fighting based on the gunas, which is Rajaguna or Tamaguna. So, but God is always transcendental. That is the thing we should note. Thank you, Bali Prabhu. That's very helpful. Uh, Sri Madhava Mahotsava said, it seems that one person cultivates pure passion and another pure goodness. Goodness will always be victorious. Sure, but you'll notice that sometimes the demons are victorious because passion is prominent at a particular time. At other times, goodness is prominent. That's why at certain times, Vishnu tells the demigods that you'll have to wait till the time is opportune here in the material world because now the demons have the advantage. Another uh, reflection or question? Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. 
From Aruba, Where are you? Aruba. From Argentina. Chai, Haribol. Good to see you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you also. Thank you for the lecture. Yeah, in the purpose, Shila Prabhupada said about that in the war, both uh, lose. Also, the, he gave the example of the Germany and the British. So when the war is, is happened, everybody lose. Yeah. Like George Harrison sang in that song, uh, Sue Me, Sue You Blues. He said, let's get together. We'll all get together and have a bad time. <laughs> it's in his lyric. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, when it's in the mode of passion, the result is always the same. There's, there's this breaking down at the end. At the beginning, it seems fortuitous, but then something grinds down everything that you were trying to do. And there's a way that if somebody's doing a duty and it becomes troublesome and they say, I quit out of the mode of passion, then you don't get the result that you're looking for. So really, um, this chapter is shaping up and we'll give more and more evidence here. Prabhupada, uh, first of all, Shukadeva Goswami is giving the evidence. Prabhupada's then piling it on uh, more and more evidence to prove that we are self-determining. That is, uh, it's our... A prerogative as uh, conscious living beings. We're not dead stones, but we're agents we can change and we can improve ourselves by applying the principles of Shastra so that we come to the mode of goodness. Most people don't know this because they're under the modes of passion and ignorance and it's hard for them to understand the principle. That's why it's important to propagate goodness and also give transcendental knowledge so people can develop discrimination and understand it. Yeah, I was just uh, reading this morning in the Yoga Sutras, and it's remarkable how edifying cultivation of the sattvic principles is. For instance, uh, maybe I'll just read you a couple lines from Patanjali's work here. So you'll be shocked and amazed. Do you want to be shocked and amazed? Anybody that doesn't, yeah. you can just put yeah. yourself, just yeah. mute me for a minute here. And then I'll let you know when you come back on if you don't want to be too shaken up. So here he's talking about the yamas by which you have to, to cultivate um, this uh, sattvaguna. So first one is nonviolence. In the presence of one who is established in nonviolence, enmity is abandoned. When one is established in truthfulness, one ensures the fruit of action, ensures the fruit of actions of others. When one is established in refrainment from stealing, all jewels manifest. These are sutras, so I'll just say a couple of things about them. Upon the establishment of celibacy, power is attained. When refrainment from covetousness becomes firmly established, knowledge of the ways and wherefores of births manifest. So he, uh, Patanjali uh, Vyas, giving his commentary on this, describes how for each one of these um, yamas in which one uh, becomes an agent of change and uh, self-disciplines and develops these particular um, sattvic habits, that there's a fruit. For instance, covetousness in, means that I, I want what other people have. I want to take it from them. And uh, this body, he points out, is actually somebody else's. <laughs> and if I, want, if I want to enjoy it myself, this is my body, I'm going to keep it, I'm going to enjoy it, I'll destroy it if I want this coveting somebody else's property. When one gives up all sense of covetousness, then he says the mind becomes so still and clear this like on a pond that's clear and still, you can see the pebbles at the bottom very clearly. And he says, so a person that's developed that kind of stillness of mind is able to see uh, his or her previous uh, lifetimes very clearly, uh, what I did, what brought me to this uh, position and so forth. And in the, the one previous to that, he says, um, he says, when one is established in refrainment from stealing, all jewels manifest. So different uh, acharyas have different 
comments on that that says if you if you completely give up the desire to steal and you don't steal completely refrain then there's a way in which uh, all kinds of wealth starts getting attracted to you <laughs> for various reasons so my point is that when we develop sattvagun we attract all good things when we develop rajagun then we run 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 and end up hitting a wall and when we go into tamagun it's like we're smashed down and we can't we can't move we're just at the bottom of the barrel it's very difficult so it's up to us as krishna says in the bhagavad gita urvam gachanti sattvasta madhyam uh, uh, <clears throat> Tishtanti Madhava, Jaganya Gunavriti Sta, Adoga Chanti Tamasa. So he's describing what happens when you when you're in the different modes, when you cultivate these different modes. If you're in sadva, you get um, lifted up. If you stay in rajas and cultivate that, you'll stay in the middle level. And uh, we're in the middle level here on the planet right now, and it's not so pleasant, I must say. And then uh, if you cultivate the abominable mode of ignorance, you get dragged down into hell. Asuryanamate loka antena tamasavrita tamste pritya vigachanti yeke chat mahanojana. You get to go live with the other soul killers somewhere when you do that. Let's see, this is from Radhakripa Prabhu. Oh, Man Manjula Kanta also commented the body is actually someone else's. What does that actually mean? Well, where did you get it? by the way. Did you pay for it or anything? <laughs> Did you sign, sign a contract? <laughs> it's not yours. If it was yours, you'd get to keep it, but you got to give it back anytime. It's like a rent a car. And it, you, know, you say, hey, it's my cool car. I'm driving around. And then uh, he's like, your friends are, ha, ha, ha. That's very funny. You got to give it back tomorrow. So the body's like that. It's not ours. I like that. If it's yours, you get to keep it. That's yeah. Really nice yours. Whatever is actually quintessentially ours, we get to keep, right? So, Radha Kripa Prabhu says, uh, <clears throat> it seems no mode of nature is permanent. So what should one try to do? Even if try, even if we try, are, are not we still, we are not still, will we not still be influenced by other modes of material nature in our efforts? Yes, if you, if you stay within just a regular mode of goodness, then eventually you'll be influenced by Rajas or Thomas because as Krishna says in the 14th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the modes are always churning. So you may be cruising in the mode of goodness and then Raj, there'll be an upsurge in Rajas or Thomas that will come and uh, uh, drag you down. So what should you do? Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Mamchayo vyabhichare na bhakti yogena sevate that is, stay consistently engaged in bhakti. Because by that, you'll rise above the modes of material nature and come to the level of Brahman. And that's where you want to be. And finally, we have, um, so what is really ours? It is our piety and service. Yeah, our, our eternal constitutional position is that we're servants. And uh, Barsha, does that mean that actually nothing belongs to us, but we also belong to Krishna? That's right. That's what Atmanivedana means, Barsha. Atmanivedana means the realization that I don't own anything. Everything belongs to Krishna. Even myself doesn't belong to me. That belongs to Krishna too. I give my very self, Krishna, that's yours. And when we do that, then there's complete satisfaction because that's our constitutional position. Shraddha, anything on Facebook? Uh, no, Facebook is quiet today, Maharaj, and so is YouTube. But we have a reflection by Sivatsa on chat, on the Zoom chat. Oh, we do, eh? Oh, okay, good. Shivata Prabhu says, it seems as if every living entity has a choice of which mode of material nature they want to situate themselves through association and whether or not they want to surrender to the Lord. However, at the same time, a perfect balance is still maintained by the Supreme Lord, while all the living entities also have their own minute independence. How does Krishna do it? To an extent, it seems like it's in Krishna's control, but out of his control at the same time. Because Krishna has the control of everything, but jivas have their independence. It also seems like the balance changes between yugas. 
how does the Lord maintain control while also giving Jesus freedom? Well, this is um, this is the uh, the the sixty four thousand dollar question, and um, uh, Krishna um, gives freedom to the living entity because if the freedom isn't there, then how will there be love? And that's the ultimate goal. And Krishna's ultimate goal of expanding himself into living entities is to exchange love with them. So if they don't have a free choice, then pure love isn't, isn't available. So he gives free choice to the living entity, which a freedom means, uh, as Gandhi once said, freedom means the, uh, the freedom to make the wrong decision. And so if we misuse the independence, that's part of our independence as well. And Krishna maintains that balance so that that impetus can always be there to come back to him. And by the way, when somebody's in lower modes of nature, it is very difficult for them to make decisions because they don't have the light of sattva in order to see what's the right thing. They don't have discrimination. That's why it's important to propagate Krishna consciousness because as you've many, many of you have noticed when you're teaching Krishna consciousness to somebody, they can wake up. They get some prasadam, they hear the holy names, they get association, they hear the philosophy, and then suddenly they change their ways because they realize that they have a choice. And Krishna helps them from within the heart. Okay, so now I'm going to read a couple more verses. This is number nine. The all-pervading personality of God exists within the heart of every living being, and an expert thinking can perceive how he is present there to a large or small extent, just as one can understand the supply of fire and wood, the water in a water pot, or the sky within a pot. One can understand whether a living entity is a demon or a demigod by understanding that living entity's devotional performances. A thoughtful man can understand how much a person is favored by the Supreme Lord by seeing his actions. Purport. In Bhagavad Gita 1041, the Lord says, Yad yad vibhuri mat sattvam shrimad urjitam vivava tattadevava gacha tvang mama ting shom shasam bhavam. Know that all beautiful, glorious, and mighty creations spring from but a spark of my splendor. We have the practical experience of seeing that one person is able to do very wonderful things, whereas another cannot do those same things and cannot even do things that require only a little common sense. Therefore, how much a devotee has been favored by the Supreme Personality of Godhead can be tested by the activities the devotee has performed. In Bhagavad Gita 10.10, the Lord says, Teshan satata yukta nam vajatam priti purvakam danami buddhi yogam tam yena mam To those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. This is very practical. A teacher instructs the student if the student is capable of taking more and more instructions. Otherwise, in spite of being instructed by the teacher, the student cannot make strides in his understanding. This has nothing to do with partiality. When Krishna says, Teshan satati yuktanam bhajatam priti purvakam, Dadami Buddha Yogam Tam, this indicates that Krishna is prepared to give bhakti yoga to everyone. But one must be capable of receiving it. That is the secret. Thus, when a person exhibits wonderful devotional activities, a thoughtful man understands that Krishna has been more favorable to this devotee. This is not difficult to understand, but envious persons do not accept that Krishna has bestowed his favor upon a particular devotee in accordance with his advanced position. Such foolish persons become envious and try to minimize an advanced devotee's activities. That is not Vaishnavism. A Vaishnava should appreciate the service rendered to the Lord by other Vaishnavas. Therefore, Vaishnava is described in Srimad Bhagavatam as Nirmatsara. Vaishnavas are never envious of other Vaishnavas or of anyone else. And therefore they are called Nirmatsaranam Satam, as Bhagavad Gita informs us, one can understand how one is saturated with sattvagun, rajagun, or tamagun. In the examples given herewith, fire represents the mode of goodness. One can understand the constitution of a container for wood, petrol, 
or other inflammable substances by the quantity of the fire. Similarly, water represents Rajagun, the mode of passion. A small skin and the vast Atlantic Ocean both contain water, and by seeing the quality, quantity rather, of water in a container, one can understand the size of the container. The sky represents the mode of ignorance. The sky is present in a small earthen pot and also in outer space. Thus, by proper judgment, one can see who is a devata or demigod and who is an asura, yaksha or rakshasa, according to the quantities of sattvagun, rajagun, and tamagun. One cannot judge whether a person is a devata or an asura or a rakshasa by seeing him, but a sane man can understand this by the activities such a person performs. A general description is given in the Padma Purana. Vishnu Bhakta Smito Daiva Asura A devotee of Lord Vishnu is a demigod, whereas an asura or yaksha is just the opposite. An asura is not a devotee of Lord Vishnu. Instead, for his sense gratification, he is a devotee of the demigods, bhutas, pretas, and so on. Thus, one can judge who is a devata, who is a rakshasa, and who is an asura by how they conduct their activities. The word atmanam in this verse means paramatmanam. The paramatma or super soul is situated in the core of everyone's heart, antataha. This is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 1861. Ishvara Sarvabhutanam The Ishvara, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, being situated in everyone's heart, gives directions to everyone in terms of one's capabilities in taking the instructions. Oh boy, am I going to read that one again? You could tell, right? Are you ready? <laughs> Say yes. The Ishvara, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, being situated in everyone's heart, gives directions to everyone in terms of one's capabilities in taking the instructions. I read earlier in the Yoga Sutra about how if one is established in a truthfulness, then what complete truthfulness, whatever that person says will manifest. And that said, therefore, uh, saints, they'll give benedictions and if they, if they give a benediction to somebody, then it'll come true. And uh, said, some of the commentators went on to say that, but actually they're, they're careful because they only give to people that deserve them, you know, benedictions in that way. So um, there's this uh, very important uh, principle that we're talking about here, about capability. Krishna himself says in the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita that if somebody has become more qualified by being situated in sattva and is performing activities conducive to illuminating the consciousness, it's much easier for such a person to take to Krishna consciousness in a very determined way. And Obviously, somebody who's very qualified because of having gotten association with sadhus and so forth and can take advantage of Krishna consciousness. Continuing. The instructions of Bhagavad Gita are open to everyone, but some people understand them properly, whereas others understand them so improperly that they cannot even believe in the existence of Krishna, although reading Krishna's book. Although the Gita says Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, indicating that Krishna spoke, they cannot understand Krishna. This is due to their misfortune or incapability, which is caused by Rajaguna and Tamaguna, the modes of passion and ignorance. It is because of these modes that they cannot even understand Krishna, whereas an advanced devotee like Arjuna understands him and glorifies him, saying, Param Brahma Param Tama Pabitram Paramam. Paramam Pravan, you are the supreme Brahman, the supreme abode and purifier. Krishna is open to everyone, but one needs the capability to understand him. By external features, one cannot understand who is favored by Krishna and who is not. According to one's attitude, Krishna becomes one's direct advisor or Krishna becomes unknown. 
This is not Krishna's partiality. It is his response to one's ability to understand him. According to one's receptiveness, whether one be a devata, asura, yaksha, or rakshasa, Krishna's quality is proportionately exhibited. This proportionate exhibition of Krishna's power is misunderstood by less intelligent men to be Krishna's partiality, but actually it is no such thing. Krishna is equal to everyone, and according to one's ability to receive the favor of Krishna, one advances in Krishna consciousness. Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur gives a practical example in this connection. In the sky, there are many luminaries. At night, even in darkness, the moon is extremely brilliant and can be directly perceived. The sun is also extremely brilliant. When covered by clouds, however, these luminaries are not distinctly visible. Similarly, the more one advances in sattvaguna, the more his brilliance is exhibited by devotional service. But the more one is covered by rajaguna and tamaguna, the less visible his brilliance, for he is covered by these qualities. The visibility of one's qualities does not depend on the partiality of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It is due to the various coverings in different proportions. Thus, one can understand how far he has advanced in terms of sattvaguna and how much he is covered by rajaguna and tamaguna. Uh, Radha Kripa would see that the sattva in the material world is, it can be contaminated. So when we talk about, oftentimes in the Shastra, when sattva is mentioned, the acharyas say we're talking about shuddha sattva, which is, which is a different platform. It's the sattva, which is not tinged at all by rajas and tamas. And from that position, shuddha sattva visheshatma, that um, or sattvam vishuddham vasudeva shabditam yad iate tatra imam upavrita. One becomes uncovered, apavrita, when one comes to the shuddha sattva, the pure, unadulterated platform of sattva. Um, Srivatsa, did that last paragraph um, answer your question more? Oh, look, more things came up, a lot of them. Okay, let's see. Here we have from Divyangi. To raise ourselves above the modes, we need to stay always in devotional service. Does it mean we always have to read and chant and take care of deities, for example? Or does it also mean that sometimes parents have to take care of kids and do many other things? And there's no time for reading or listening classes as much as we want. What in this way is our devotional service? What in this way in our devotional service? Thank you very much. Oh yeah, I mean, we can ask any of the parents on this call here um, about, um, you know, having kids. There's a way in which, you know, you, you have a duty to do for your kids. And maybe at some point, some periods in your life, it's um, hearing and chanting, opportunities are more abundant and at other times they're not but as we continue into whatever capacity we can perform devotional service that is the nine direct processes then all of our activities are transformed in fact as we're performing all kinds of worldly duties and performing devotional service at the same time we get a special realization because we have the wherewithal to see how the modes of material nature are working and also there's a way that we're tasting devotional service and we may feel held back for some time by the circumstances, but in our heart, we're developing more and more eagerness to hear and chant. And then when we get the opportunity, we can take full advantage of it. There's a verse in the Sri Shapanishad number 11 that says, Vidyam cha vidyam chayas tadvedo vayam saha avidya yamratum tirtva vidya yamratum ashnute. Only one who can learn the process of nescience and that of transcendental knowledge side by side can transcend the influence of repeated birth and death and enjoy the full blessings of immortality. So because our appearance in this world means we already have a material body and mind, <clears throat> there's no time at which they actually completely let up. Well, there are circumstances for the Jivan Mukta, 
uh, but still the uh, the mind and body go on connecting to the material world one way or another and there's uh, um, impulses from the mind and even from previous samskars that can arise at any time so one has to go on performing devotional service despite the fact that he or she may not be able to do as much at certain periods of life as as they want and by that process of continuing throughout a lifetime through various stages of life one comes to the paramahamsa stage okay uh, let's see what else um tadiya seva tasyai veheto prayatete kovido thank you for that verse uh, Deva Vrata, I'm so glad to learn that everyone in LA is working very hard. And Krishna consciousness is so nice that you are aspiring for still more work. That is a sign of spiritual life. In the material world, we want to minimize our activities and take rest more. But in the spiritual world, there is no rest and there is no limit of activities. Krishna is unlimited, his service is unlimited, and the energy of his servants is unlimited. I'm so glad to learn that you are prepared to work even harder as a forward soldier to fight the Maya. May Krishna give you more and more strength. From Srila Prabhupada's letter to Tamal Krishna, Hawaii, 18th March, 1969. Um, that was Deva Vrata Prabhu's reflection on uh, 719. Uh, here we have, this is, oh, Danavari. Yes, I like the point that the body is not ours. We're renting a body for some time. I heard one song today. Hey, Jiva, why are you so proud? You are living in a rental house. You have, a, you have to vacate soon. I realize that if I keep this in my mind, then my ego is down, yeah? So it helps me to concentrate on bhakti easily. Thank you. You're quite welcome. And then uh, Deva Vrata Prabhu said, how do we become fully receptive? Follow what... Uh, what um, Danavari said in the previous uh, message, and you'll become more receptive. Bali to everyone, such a great purport. This is the beauty of Prabhupada. Haribo. Bali, you're, uh, you're on some, you know, you're past the Viraja River, as usual, but we only see it when we see you online. Yogesh, uh, Hare Krishna. Glory to Prabhupada, Hare Krishna, Yogesh. Sri Vatsa agreed. He said, yes, it helped. What should be done to improve the capability and intelligence to understand Krishna and come out of the modes of ignorance and passion? Well, one is to follow the four regular principles. And you do that, and it helps you to purify your mind and senses. So there's several activities that are particularly recommended for coming to the Sattva Gun. One is Japa. Japa is extremely important. The next one is Swadhyaya, which means, uh, it means self-examination, but it's come to mean over many, uh, many, many years, uh, the Acharyas uh, count it in the category of a reading or count reading Shastra and hearing Shastra to be a Swadhyaya because the Shastra tells you who you are. And it's, it's, a, it's a vital practice to perform every single day. And another one of the practices is to work for Krishna, to do some kind of uh, service so that uh, you can engage your, ser your senses in Krishna's service. So these are listed as three ways through which you can develop. And then you have to uh, develop your willpower. It's important for yogis to, um, bhakti yogis or any kind of yogi, to develop some spiritual strength. And so we have to practice controlling the senses. So that takes a lot of work because the senses are like serpents and they can bite at any time. So we have to uh, train them. And also, uh, if we go on with the practices I mentioned, then the snakes of the senses become like a serpent without any fangs. So even if they bite, they jump out at us. They don't affect us like they normally would. So uh, practice. Uh, the times when we can um, control the mind, control the senses, and engage them rather in Krishna's service. Uh, in the <laughs> Yoga Sutras, again, there's this point in controlling the mind count, ca counter thoughts. So when a thought comes out of nowhere about some kind of sense gratification or a hateful thought, envious thought about someone else, then Vyasadeva says in his commentary uh, to the Sutra, 
that uh, you should counter that thought by uh, another thought. That means um, you should think of something else in relation to that. So for instance, uh, if you know the tongue wants to taste something forbidden, then you just think of eating sand dish instead. Uh, if you want to say something uh, negative about somebody, then instead uh, change that thought, say something positive, because he said then it leaves an impression, a samskar. And he said, if you do this deliberately, it starts to um, cover over those negative thoughts and so forth. But the most powerful uh, point is to develop a higher taste by um, actually um, breaking through the um, lower modes by Ishvara Pranidhan. This is the ultimate success that Patanjali says. I'm just continuing with what he says. And... Uh, all the acharyas who comment and say, Ishvar Pranidhan means to offer yourself in submission to God. In fact, if you can't do anything else, do that. <laughs> because if you just get down on your knees and pray and, and offer yourself to God, or even if you're not demonstrative, if you're calling out in your, in your heart constantly, please help me, I need you, and please show and let me surrender to you. Even though I'm fallen, I can't do it, I can't control my sense, I can't do anything. But if you do Ishvara Pranidhan, then God, he's so merciful, he'll help you. So that's the topmost recommendation. It actually helps you to uh, shortcut all the other processes. But um, it helps if you try to help yourself also. Okay, there was a couple more. Yeah, okay. Oh, yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, Maharaj, uh, you are talking about how to be in goodness. And today we were reading from the Shumat Bhavatam, uh, 10 Canto, uh, 48, uh, chapter, text 31. And it talks about that the rivers and the holy places can purify ourselves, but it takes time to do that. But when we have the, when we see a, a pure devotee, a pure person, that is like in a second, like in the moment. Yes, that's true. That's a, it's a really good point. And um, actually, I just read a similar point in the Yoga Sutras today, where it was mentioned that when somebody is illuminated by spiritual practice, then they, just by their presence, they affect others. And this is also in the nectar of devotion that a pure, a pure Vaishnav then has what's like moon rays that come from his or her heart and it affects others. So, all influences are, are subtle, ultimately. And the subtlety of somebody's purity actually shines forth. And it's, it's uh, something that comes up in, in many places in the Bhagavatam. For instance, um, Prabhupada talks of, about how the, the saffron mercy particles, when a, a devotee speaks, because the, the tone is... Uh, saturated with this uh, love for Krishna, he, poetically it says it gets mixed with saffron particles from the Lord's lotus feet. So he said, when you hear that sound vibration, you at once wake up. You wake up to spiritual life. And many devotees have had this experience when they've met an advanced devotee and they suddenly just feel convinced. It overrides all their other thoughts, like, you know, I need to stay in the material world a little longer, then I'll take the devotional service or whatever. And then they just say, oh, forget it, I'm gonna do it now. <laughs> and it's the subtle influence that comes from a pure person. So our movement really is based on purity. And our, our happiness in life is based on our purity and our spiritual integrity. Because the more we actually attain the um, position of sincerely practicing devotional service, controlling the senses and so forth, then um, the more uh, we'll directly experience the happiness of Krishna consciousness, not something theoretical, but it's something that we're seeing, feeling, tasting for ourselves. And then when we speak about it, it has uh, more relevance to others, not just theoretical. Vaishnava mukon girnam putam harikatam ritam. This is uh, this uh, verse from the Shastra says uh, that. If, if somebody is a non Vaishnava and speaks, then there's a way in which uh, the sound vibration, even if it's Bhagavata, it, uh, 
it, it, it acts like poison. Sarpochista uh, yatapaya, it's like a milk touched by the lips of the serpent. And the opposite is true as well. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Okay, there was a couple more here. Oh, that's Srivas. I recognize that squeak from the uh, fire alarm. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mukharavinda Prabhu said, thank you for explaining difference between sattva and shuddha sattva. Did Patanjali talk in Yoga Sutras about sattva and shuddha sattva? Uh, also, just curious to know if Vaishnava Acharyas have given commentary. Yeah. Yeah, plenty of Vaishnava commentary. In fact, uh, Advaita Prabhu is a great scholar, and he, uh, he's a Hare Krishna devotee. He wrote this book. Uh, he, just the section I read early this morning, he was just, he giving abundant evidence about how uh, Patanjali himself is a Vaishnav. And, um, you know, Patanjali tried not to reveal too much. He tried to keep this book very neutral because it's actually a, a practical book. It's not very philosophical or theological, although he does come out and say, by worshiping Ishvara and uh, chanting his name, which is at Om, then, then uh, that's the, the shortcut. And yes, uh, there's a lot of detailed explanation of sattva and shuddha, and shuddha sattva. In fact, in very psychological terms and in technical terms, the way in which the buddhi, which is the closest thing to the, to the purusha or the, the living entity, when it comes to the point of, of uh, pure sattva, then it, it uh, no longer acts like a, um, a subtle material element, that the subtle material element that it is, but it becomes uh, spiritualized. And he gives the same example that Prabhupada get, gives repeatedly about how if you put an iron rod in fire, then it becomes uh, fire-like. So similarly, when you uh, spiritualize your buddhi, then it, it also becomes uh, spiritualized as well. And that's when you're, you come to this level of shuddha sattva. Okay, what am I doing here? We're reading a few more. We um, have, um, yes? What do we have? So, Facebook? Yeah, a few comments on Facebook. Yeah. Let's bring in the, our, our uh, friends and colleagues from Facebook. Okay, so we'll start with Divyanga Prabhu. His was the first. And he's, he's, he's happy of the Shavnadi gel. And I really need it. And it seems like I'm standing in the jaws of death. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Leela Thank you, Deb. Leela Nandi Mataji says that our false ego is blown away by the true understanding that this body does not belong to us, but belongs to Lord Krishna. No wonder it never listens to us. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a great relief, actually. This morning I read in a commentary about how um, Vyasadeva says, the happiness of giving up all material desire is greater than any happiness you could ever get in the material world since time immemorial, including um, you know, any material riches, going to the topmost heavenly planets, just the one thing of actually uh, abandoning one's attachment to uh, the idea that I, I'm going to enjoy the material world, said just that preliminary stage uh, imparts a, a happiness that's so abundant you can't compare it to anything else. And obviously we know that, you know, Rupa Goswami then says in the Nectar of, of Devotion, the Bhakti of Samrita Sindhu, that the various qualities of happiness. And that is just relief from, from the oppression, bottom udva hatovi mudhan, of the mudhas, of keeping material desires and maintaining them. And when you're free from that, there's this sense of, of huge relief. Brahma Bhutta Prasanatma, Nashochini, just a joyfulness, uh, which is a natural thing. But that's just preliminary because he says, Brahman happiness multiplied millions and millions of times. Then you get the happiness of uh, devotional service, which is, uh, makes the Brahman happiness look like just a little drop compared to the ocean. And something else, Shraddha? Yes, Mother, a couple more. Uh, there's Jira Nirsingha Prabhu from Boise. Jai. And he's about the equality that works. He's saying that example of rain is applicable in this connection. Rain falls everywhere equally, 
but only some part of that land receives it properly, while other part, like stones, does not. Krishna's direction becomes clearer to those who have the capacity to receive it. That's a really nice point. Thanks for uh, reiterating that. And that's, that goes to our job as, uh, as sadhakas. Uh, get, our, get yourself ready. Prepare yourself to receive more mercy. Find out the ways in which to put yourself in a position so that you can be a receptacle for, for Krishna's mercy. And the last one, Shraddha? So there's a question there. Can I bring up a question? Yes. Okay. So this is from Shingar Rasa Mataji. And she's saying that on the point of countering our thoughts, would it not lead to repressing our feelings, which may later on come out in a more malignant way? Well, here's one of the principles that comes in that section that, that uh, can be helpful. Said so when, when uh, thoughts that could be detrimental come up, we should, uh, we should analyze them carefully. Don't just react to them and grab onto them and say uh, yes, no. But he, um, part of what, what this section on uh, giving counter thoughts means is to uh, follow up in your mind what the fruit of that is. For instance, um, if one is at attached to uh, killing an animal and eating it, he says, then consider the fact that the Shastra says that you'll have to suffer in hell for thousands of years for killing one animal. So then decide, do I want to kill the animal? If a person lusts, you know, a man lusts after a woman, then he said, okay, consider what the result of that is going to be. In fact, there was a TV commercial in Australia where this man is riding his horse and he comes to a ravine and he hears a screaming and there's this uh, beautiful maiden and she's holding on to a branch over a cliff. And then it goes through his mind, like saving her. And then he brings her out. And then they get married and they move in and then the mother-in-law moves in and then there's everyone's, the baby's crying and they run out of money and you know, <laughs> nothing works. And then he just rides away. <laughs> I'm not recommending that, but <laughs> I'm just saying that uh, this is what he says is discrimination and counterthought. And you don't have to accept your thoughts wholesale and you can actually um, consider more. This is called Vivek. When they come to you, you don't have to accept envy. You don't have to accept all these things. It's not repression, but it's processing. Repression is another thing when you just say, um, you know, I'm not going to think about it. But if you process it and think, well, like, what's the other side of this? Like, if you think of somebody and, and you know, say, you know, I really hate that person, you think, well, what do I really hate about them? I do a lot of the same things myself. Uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, what I see in them uh, that's reflective of me <laughs> that I hate. You know, you can consider it. So that's not repression, but that's actually um, a discrimination. So uh, a yogi should have a discriminating mind to consider, uh, you know, what's really going on around me. And that will be helpful in uh, moving through the world without overreacting to the mind's uh, very, most of the time, often uh, odd suggestions. And now we just have a couple minutes left. So we'd like to have a little kirtan. Brahma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya
Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, 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 Hare
Jai Shri Rup Sanatan Bhatta Raghunashi Jeev Gopal Bhatt Das Raghunash Shad Goswami Prabhu Ki Jai Jai Shri Shri Swarup Damodar Shri Roy Ramanandani Gora Shakta Varga Ki Jai Nam Acharya Shri Hari Das Thakur Ki Jai Prem Zika Ho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gora Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai Jai Shri Antar Deep Mayapur, Simanta Deep Godruma Deep, Madhya Deep, Kola Deep, Vritu Deep, Jana Deep, Modya Druma Deep, Vritu Deep, Patma Kashinava Deep, Dham Ki Jai. Shri Shri Radha Krishna, Gokopina, Shamakunda, Radha Kunda, Giri Govardhan, Dwada Shavanatma Kashi, Vraja Mandala Ki Jai. Dwada Shupavana Ki Jai. Shri Shamakunda, Radha Kunda, Jamuna Ganga Tulsi Bhakti Devi Ki Jai. Shri Jagannath Baladev Subhaji Ji Ki Jai. Jai Bhakti Vignama Nasha Nashina Shingadev Ki Jai. Bhakta Pravada Shri Pallad Maharaj Ki Jai. Shri Vraja Manila Shri Goda Manila Shri Shetara Mandala Ki Jai. Chari Vaishnav Sampradaya Ki Jai. Chari Vaishnav Acharya Ki Jai. Shri Hari Ram Sankirtan Ki Jai. Anatta Koti Vaishnavini Ki Jai. Uttara Shrimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Sambeda Bhaktarini Ki Jai. All glories to some of the votees. All glories to some of the votees. All glories to some of the votees. Namaste Narasimhaya. Namaste Narasimhaya. Hiranyakashi Purvakshaha. Hiranyakashi Purvakshaha. Shilatanka Nakalaye. Shilatanka Nakalaye. Ito Nishingha Parato Nishingha. Nishingha Parato Nishingha. Yato Yato Nishingha. Yato Yato Yamita Toh Nishingha. Hiranyakashi Nishingha Ridaye Nishingha. Nishingha Ridaye Nishingha. Navarin Sharanam Prapadye. Nishingha Madhim. Come 
tuning in and um, there are only two rules ultimately always remember Krishna and never forget. never forget so practice a lot because, uh, we have a great boon not only did we get a human life but we also got lined up with the great acharyas who will pour their mercy down on us so don't lament about anything just move forward with your, um, whatever you have to do to keep body and soul together, that'll um, come and go as, as is uh, necessary, do your level best, but uh, put as much effort as possible into hearing about Krishna, chanting about him, and uh, showing mercy to others by giving them the opportunity to hear about Krishna. Does that sound okay? Is, is it doable? Is yeah. that doable? Yeah. Yes. You know, do that? Yes. Let's come out on. Let's come out on top. We won't waste this uh, this time, this crisis, but we'll we'll push forward and we'll we'll spring out of it like um, we we're shot from cannons. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, and thank you, Shraddha, for your diligence and uh, keeping the framework and everything moving so nicely. We really appreciate it. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.